Hello, and welcome to Perihelion Day. Some of you may not be familiar with what Perihelion even means, or why I would even record a little video about it, so this is my explanation. Perihelion is the day in which the Earth is closest to the Sun, today being January 4th, 2023. Now, this might bring up some questions for you, because if you're unfamiliar with January, we're in winter right now, but we're actually closest to the sun. So we can use this sort of day to discuss why seasons exist at all. So let's take a step back and look at some background here. Johannes Kepler was a scientist who was born in 1571 and passed in 1630. Kepler was deeply religious and believed that understanding the geometry of the heavens would bring him closer to God. And astronomers had long assumed that heavenly objects move in perfect circles, which were considered to be the perfect and harmonious of all uh, geometric shapes. They believed that if a perfect God resided in heaven, along with the stars and the planets, then the motions of these objects must be perfect too. So like those before him, Kepler believed that planetary orbits should be perfectly circular. He attempted to find a unified model of the solar system by using these circular orbits, but in doing so, he found that some of his own predictions were off by as much as eight arc minutes. Uh, this is one quarter the angular diameter of the moon in the night sky. Arc minutes, just to be clear, these are angular measurements, just like we use degrees or radians to measure angles. An arc minute is one sixtieth of a degree. That's not important for this lecture, but you get the idea. So... This discrepancy was significant. In fact, Kepler was quoted in response to these discrepancies saying, if I had believed that we could ignore these eight minutes of arc, I would have patched up my hypothesis accordingly. But since it was not permissible to ignore, those eight minutes pointed, or, uh, pointed the road to a complete reformation in astronomy. In other words, this small discrepancy led Kepler to abandoning the idea of circular orbits and to the correct answer, which is the fact that orbits are elliptical. So Kepler's key discovery was that planetary orbits are this type of oval known as an ellipse. For some background, uh, the top right image here shows you this. You can use two straight pins um, for foci and a loop of string, and you can trace out a curve while keeping the string tight and if you do that, you will have drawn an ellipse, like you see in the picture. The further you spread the pins or the foci apart, the flatter the resulting ellipse. The flatness of an ellipse is known as its eccentricity. So, a perfectly circular orbit has no eccentricity. In other words, its eccentricity is zero. But the greater the value of E, or the greater the eccentricity of the orbit, the flatter or more eccentric it will be. Now, even though we said our orbit is not perfectly circular, it is very close. Earth's eccentricity is 0 0.0167, a very small number indicating that it is very close to being circular, but not. So, this is actually summarized in one of Kepler's three laws, his first law, which states that the path of each planet around the sun is an ellipse. In other words, the distance from the sun varies. So a planet, such as the Earth, will be closest to the sun at a point we call perihelion. Peri means near and helios means sun in Greek. So today, January 4th, is that day. It is perihelion day, the day we are closest to the sun. Aphelion, which happens in July, is when we are furthest from the sun. So that brings us to today, January 4th, 2023. So we are closest to the sun on this day, and this always occurs between January 2nd and January 5th of any given year. 
So on the left, I've just provided a table which shows you the dates in which perihelion will occur through the year 2029. So this really brings up an interesting point. We are closest to the sun in winter, January, and furthest from the sun around summer in July. Because of this, first of all, if you look at the sun, don't look at it, of course, with your direct eyes, but when you look at the sun, that would mean if we're closer, the sun should look bigger, and when we're further, the sun should look smaller. And it does. It's a very subtle difference, however. Here's the difference in the size of the sun in our sky from our closest point, perihelion, to the furthest point on the right, aphelion. Notice it's not a significant difference. Uh, it, you know, if you look up at the night sky, or the daytime sky, if you look up at the sun, and you look at it in January versus in July, you're not going to be able to notice the sun is any bigger or smaller. It's not a substantial difference. And that's important to us because that difference is small. Although the Earth's orbital distance does vary over the course of the year, that variation is very small. It's a little bit uh, over 3% of a difference. And just going back to this picture, the numbers are huge on the right-hand side in this picture, right? Um, it's saying that, you know, at aphelion, we're furthest away, 94 and a half million miles away from the sun. When we're closest, it's 91.4 million miles away. So even though that is a difference of about uh, 3 million miles, that is such a small amount compared to the overall distance from the sun, that it's only a 3% difference. In other words, it is not the Earth's distance from the sun that causes our seasons. You know, winter being very cold, with short days, summer being very warm, with longer days. The real reason for the seasons is the fact that the Earth's axis is tilted by 23 and a half degrees. So, the reason for seasons is our axial tilt. It is not the distance from the sun, which is only a difference of 3% from the closest to the furthest point. Now, this 23.5 degree tilt is maintained throughout the entire orbit around our sun. So in this image, if you look at this, the northern hemisphere is tilted up and to the right all the way around the sun. So over on the left, we are tilted in the northern hemisphere toward the sun, being summer, and on the right side of this image, you can see the northern hemisphere is tilted away from the sun, being winter. Now, this allows us to understand why our seasons are here at all. We're tilted toward the sun in summer, away from the sun in winter. So what effect does that have? Why is it so much warmer and why do we have a difference in daytime uh, length? Well, think about what this means. We have two images here. On the left is summer on the right is winter for somebody at 40 degrees north latitude, which is somewhere kind of in the central United States. Well, as we transition to summer, the left-hand picture, the sun is high in the sky because we are tilted toward the sun in the summer. So not only does that mean we have a more efficient heating of the Earth's surface because it's higher up in the sky, it's more concentrated sunlight, but it's higher in the sky, which means it has to take a longer path to get up there and come back down, lengthening how much daylight we have and thus increasing the amount of time for heating to take place. So as a result, we have longer days and hotter days. That, that being the axis of the, uh, the Earth's, uh, excuse me, the tilt of the Earth's axis, that is the reason for seasons. So, I just thought I would use this as a, a point to discuss seasons, why they occur, and to celebrate, I guess, our perihelion day. Today, again, January 4th, is the day that we are closest to the sun. As always, thank you for watching. Um, this is my first uh, kind of special topic. Uh, everything I've uploaded prior to this has been an actual lecture. Uh, going forward, I do intend to make a lot more special topic videos, including um, smaller ones uh, about topics that might even branch out further from what I've talked about already in my lectures. 
I also intend to include for my physics courses uh, videos where I work out problems individually as their own video. So I'm going to do a lot more work to create better and better videos and more of them going forward. So I really appreciate everyone's support throughout all of this. I know my uploading has been slow as I focus on my own students, but I am now working to expand on what I have here on YouTube. And again, for all my subscribers, I can't thank you guys enough. Uh, all the kind words I've seen in comments mean the world to me. If you have asked questions in videos in the past, I do apologize. I typically don't have time to get to most of the questions I see in YouTube. Uh, it's nothing personal if I don't get to respond, but hopefully I can work on that more with time. Anyways, as always, thank you for watching. Y'all have a great day.